morning. You guys feeling all right this morning? You good? You recovered from Thanksgiving. Amen. All right. Trip to fan is out of the system and we are back on track. Amen. Okay. Amen. Um, good morning to Shaw, our Shaw campus right now. We welcome you. Can we welcome our Shaw campus is joining us via live stream. Um, this is our fourth week uh, as one church in two locations. Uh, we are, as I mentioned last week, we're going to start live streaming to step into the light homeless ministries, but then we also had two other agencies reach out to us this week, uh, and we're going to start live streaming, providing live streaming to other homeless agencies and, and, and other agencies around the city and around the state. Um, I could see this in a year, like we're just being every homeless shelter in St. Louis. Um, and as it turns out, we also learned uh, that there are some folks who are, I don't know what you would call it, but I guess you would call it porch churches. People are getting together. Uh, had somebody contact us from Texas and uh, some folks in Arizona. Different people are getting together and watching our services and using them as a, uh, an opportunity for fellowship and, and Bible study and reflection. Uh, so we welcome everybody. Amen? Amen. Um, I am, uh, I'm excited today. Because we're gonna, um, we're gonna, uh, we're actually in the middle of a coat drive. Um, so uh, we started it this week, and um, this is sponsored by one of our life groups. Uh, they're called um, uh, What Breaks Your Heart Life Group. They're led by Kelly Payne, yeah. right. and uh, uh, Mo McLean is helping to organize this group. But um, this is these guys are amazing. They're one of our life groups but they have a, an outreach to uh, people in need around our city. And so um, they've already gotten a ton of coats and hats and scarves, uh, but we're gonna do it one more week. So if you have any lightly used hats, gloves, mittens, scarves, coats, jackets, sweaters, bring them next Sunday uh, and they'll, um, they'll pick them up at the front and then they will hand deliver them to the people that they serve. Uh, and it's just another awesome way for us to do outreach in our city. So please join us in that. Um, next week. And today we're going to launch a brand new series called Messiah. Uh, this series is going to take us from today all the way through Christmas Eve. And we're going to have multiple services this year um, for Christmas Eve at our Shaw campus. Uh, we'll have multiple services back to back, candlelight services, beautiful services uh, with music and just amazing Christmas Eve services. Something we haven't really been able to do very well as a portable church, but uh, now that we do have a lockdown location, we're just gonna invite everybody down to the Shaw campus um, for multiple services on, uh, on Christmas Eve. Amen? All right. Uh, so, so we're launching this new series. This, this idea of Messiah is an idea that uh, for, for thousands of years, a group of people in, in, in Israel had been longing for uh, someone to intervene into the hardest parts of their life and to bring deliverance and salvation, not only externally, but also internally. How, how many of you sometimes need some external support, some external help to get through some situations in your own life? We can't always get there on our own. We can't always do it on our own. And, and so the prophet Isaiah preached about, as well as the other prophets, about a Messiah. And what he said about this Messiah, he, 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 he wrote this in a very tumultuous time. There were wars and battles and, 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 and it, was a, it was a mess in Judea and Israel. But this is what he said, and it's beautiful. He said, for unto us a child is born. Now, now no, this is 700 years before Jesus, okay? So this is in anticipation. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And he said, and the government will be upon his shoulders. He's going to carry this weight. And then he tells us what we're going to call him. He says, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. Somebody say Wonderful Counselor. <laughs> Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Today, I, I want to spend just a few moments focusing on this wonderful counselor aspect of our Messiah in a sermon that I'm calling Never Alone. Never Alone. Uh, in 1995, October 17, 1995, in a hospital in Worcester, Massachusetts, in the NICU ward, two little baby girls were born. Uh, they were born uh, about 13 weeks premature. Uh, they, they each weighed about two pounds. Uh, there was 
a lot of, there were a lot of health complications for these two little girls. It was unclear whether or not they were going to survive. Um, but over the course of a few days, one of the little girls began to experience some strength and, and she started to put on a little bit of weight and she started you know, to even out. Uh, the other little girl did not. The twin sister did not. She, her health began to deteriorate. Her, she would have these episodes where her, her heart rate would just escalate very quickly and she would, her, her heartbeat and her heart rate would just be running wild. Her oxygen levels, her oxygen saturation levels would, would decrease. Uh, she had trouble breathing and she would have these spells where she would cry and, and, and not be able to breathe to the point where her skin would turn blue. And this was terrifying for these parents because, you know, they've got these two little babies and they're, they're two pounds each. I mean, they're just barely little tiny pre premature babies. Um, and, and nobody really knew what to do. There wasn't a clear path. And, and at one point, the medical professionals actually pulled the parents aside and they said, you know, there's... There's actually a significant likelihood that this child, the, the sick child, will not survive. One day they were uh, in the NICU unit. The parents were staying there night after night and just spending time in the hospital, living in the hospital, basically. And um, the, the little sickly child, her name was Brielle, uh, had a fit. She had a, um, a, uh, a bad spell. And she was coughing and she was, her skin was turning blue. And they were very, very worried about her. And one of the NICU nurses did something uh, that was unexpected. It wasn't hospital protocol. It had actually never been done in, uh, in, in a hospital in, 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 a, in the United States. Um, but she took the healthy infant, the, the healthy twin, out of her incubator and put her next to the sickly twin in her incubator and um, just put them next to each other. And what was interesting is that these two little, little tiny twins um, you know, they had just spent the last nine months as roommates, you know, so they were already familiar with each other. And uh, they, they kind of snuggled up next to each other, and, and the healthier twin's arm kind of slid up the back of the sickly twin and, and ended up resting on the sickly twin's shoulders. And then, to the surprise of everyone, the vital signs of the sickly twin began to normalize. Her heart rate began to de decrease to a normal level. Her oxygen saturation levels began to increase. She began to breathe more rhythmically and more slowly and at a, at a normal pace. And within a few days, she started to put on weight again. She started to get strength. She started to get health again. There was a, a photographer who was there at a local, he was from a local newspaper. He was covering a different story. Uh, and he took this picture of these two twins in this shared incubator uh, at the moment where um, this one, Brielle, began to experience health and strength. This picture then ended up, uh, they, Life magazine picked up this in, in like 1995, and then it became uh, just sort of this viral story. It spread all, all around the world. Uh, it actually changed the way, um, the way medicine is done for, for you know, uh, caring for premature kids. Uh, there's a, a new um, strategy, they call it actually kangaroo care is what they call it, because um, just this idea of, of skin to skin contact for little infants and little babies um, can be a very healthy thing for them. They can experience a, a calming effect and it can have positive impacts on their health. So this was, this moment transformed the way uh, that we do a, a part of medicine. But I think what really resonated with people is that this picture captures something that all of us sort of intuitively know in our lives. And that is that we can't do this alone. Yeah. We can't get through hard times all by ourselves. We, we need the help and the strength and the support and, 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 the, and the power of other people, the accountability and the help of other people in our life to actually make it through the hard times. When we find ourselves feeling completely alone, uh, it is a very alienating and isolating experience. Isaiah, 2,700 years ago, was saying to you and me today, he was saying, you don't have to do this alone. You don't have to go through life alone. You don't have to try to get through the struggles that you're experiencing alone. 
There is a God who wants to interact with you. He wants to engage with you. He wants to be close to you. He wants to touch you. He wants you to experience his strength. He wants you to experience his power and his love and his grace and his mercy. Because when you do, things get better. He's a deliverer. He's a Messiah. He's an anointed one. And so, so as we think about that passage today and as we, as we contemplate over the next few weeks this beautiful passage for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace, Everlasting. How do we experience that in our life? How do we, because what he's really doing, Isaiah, is what he's really doing is he's, he's revealing something that, we've all, that we're already experiencing. He's revealing something that we all need. How do we experience the Messiah in our life as we near the Christmas season? How do we move it out of the abstract and into the actual tangible? How do we take it from an idea and actually incorporate it and make it part of our life? How do we do that? Because many of us, whatever circumstance we're in, especially as we near the holidays, we find ourselves feeling at times alone. I know there are many people in our church that are, that are students here in St. Louis and you're coming from all different parts of the world. You're coming from Africa and Asia and Europe and all different parts of, uh, of the planet. And you're away from family and you're away from friends and you're away from your own culture and your own food and people that are familiar to you. And I know that there are times where you are experiencing this sense of loneliness and isolation and alienation that is absolutely heartbreaking. It's not just those who are coming from far away. Many of us who are surrounded by friends and family, many of us who have people around us that we know and that have known us and that we know them and, and we're around them, we still find ourselves at times feeling alone. And in fact, it's a profound loneliness when you're surrounded by people and yet you still feel alone. Anybody know what I'm talking about today? It's, it's almost a, a more profound loneliness when you are around people and you're not supposed to feel alone, and yet you do. I know there are many people in our church who are hustling and bustling through these holidays. You're in the middle of your craziness, your busyness, you're trucking through life, you got your career going, you're making it happen, and the busyness and the hurry can in, in a way be a buffer from that sense of loneliness that you can sometimes feel when the volume comes down and the lights come down and the, the, the cell phone goes down, right? And you start to realize that you just have this deep sense of, of loneliness. Some of you have lost friends or family members over the last months or years and the holidays remind you of the loss. The holidays actually trigger a, 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 a deep loneliness that even in a time of celebration, even when it's a time where we're supposed to be celebrating, uh, if, we don't, if, we don't, if we don't watch it, we can begin to feel lonely and, and, and sad and, and depressed during the holidays. Uh, a couple of Christmases ago, I, I, I was not acknowledging the fact that I was missing my father. It was during Christmas. <laughs> and we're, we're, my father had died many years earlier. And we were having this Christmas. And I was like, I was like the Grinch who stole Christmas that, that Christmas. My wife was like, hey, you know, <laughs> you know, we got the kids. We got the gift wrapping. And I was just going because I was, I was feeling alone. And this, this can happen to all of us. We can go through these periods. So if we have this Messiah that Isaiah prophesied about. And if he's here, and if he wants to be available to us, how do we experience him in the midst of our loneliness? How do we experience him? We have a, a practice, a peculiar practice at our home um, that um, we were talking about this week, my wife and I, um, and I, I'll try not to overshare. It's a, uh, it's a sleeping practice, mainly among me and, uh, and our children. Um, all of us have, and don't, we don't, let me just tell you what we have. We each have a blanket, okay? Like each one of my kids and I, we each have like a soft blanket. It's not a blankie, all right? I just want, I realized after I was talking about this in the first service, I don't have a blankie, all right? I just want that 
on the record. But we each have like a nice, you know, like a blanket. <laughs> it's just a blanket is all it is, people. And, uh, you know, because, and then you can sit down if you're on the couch or whatever, you got your blanket. Um, we didn't do the Snuggie. Does anybody know the Snuggie? Okay. Anybody own the Snuggie? All right. You're absolved, you're absolved, you're forgiven. Okay. Um, so this is just a regular blanket. And, um, and one of the things that happens in our home is that um, my wife is, is a night owl and I'm, I'm very, I go to sleep very early and then I wake up very early. That's just our practice. And she's up very late. Well, what we do is that our kids and I will be like hanging out in the evening and we'll all have our blankets and we'll just be doing whatever. People are reading or talking or doing whatever. And as the night descends and as the darkness falls, what happens is people, my children and I, tend to just fall asleep wherever we are, okay? So this could literally be on the floor in the living room. It could be on the kitchen floor. It could be in the hallway. It could, be, it could literally be anywhere in the house. If you, if you came into our house at three o'clock in the morning sometime, which please don't do that, but if you did, um, you would find bodies strewn about the house, wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in the hallway. I mean, you would just find us uh, about, you know? And um, my wife, this week, she, she asked me, and we'd never really talked about that. It's just, it's just, just a thing, I don't know. And uh, she asked me this week, she goes, why do you do that? Why do you just fall asleep wherever you are, you know? And I'm not trying to score points today, even though we do have an um, anniversary coming up. But, but I told her the real reason, like the reason I do it is because I really want to be near you in the evening. I don't, thank you. I got some awes on that. Um, I want to be, like, I really don't want to go be by myself in bed. I just don't want to. I like to be near you, and, but I also like to go to sleep early and so I like to be near you until I fall asleep and so that's why that happens okay um, because the reality is I don't know about you but for me sometimes I just need I just want to be in the presence of somebody that I love I just want I, all I really want is their presence I don't need I don't need them to say anything I don't need them to do anything I just want physical proximity I just want to be in the company of somebody that I love. If you've ever gone through a really hard time, you've gone through some hard circumstance, you, you, maybe you got fired from your job or you lost some money or you went through a painful divorce or you, went, you had some hard experience, you lost somebody you love. Sometimes all you need is the physical proximity, the presence of somebody else. This is why people go, this is why people have hospital visits. They go, they go to visit in the hospital just because it feels good to know that you're not alone. In, uh, in Jewish customs, they have, a, they have a, a, a custom called sitting shiva. And sitting shiva is when you, uh, when somebody dies, uh, the members of the community will come and they'll just stay at the house of the people uh, who lost a loved one. And sitting shiva just means they just sit there. They just, they're just there. They're not there to tell you anything or draw you a map about how to get out of your grief. They're just there because sometimes we just need the presence of, of, of a loving source, a loving person in our life to help us get through the hard times. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus, Jesus, when he was on the planet, he was near the end of his ministry and he knew that he was going to be leaving. And so he began to teach his disciples and he began to preach to them and began to tell them all of these things. And then in order to comfort them, in order to let them know that they wouldn't be alone, this is what he says to them. And I love this. He said, I've spoken these things to you while I remain with you. But he said, because he's getting ready to leave, the counselor, the counselor, the Holy Spirit, the Father will send him in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything that I have told you. What he's saying is, I'm getting ready to leave, but the Father is going to send the Holy Spirit as a counselor, as a wonderful counselor to not just be near you, but to live in you. He's going to be inside of your heart. He's going to be inside of your soul. And in one passage, he says, actually, it's better that I leave 
Because then the Holy Spirit, as a counselor, as a comforter, can come and be inside of you. He can come and live inside of you. Just like for me, if I'm doing something around the house and I'm, I'm, and I'm with someone that I love, I'm with my wife, it's better. It's like if she asked me to hang a picture, I do a better job if she's standing there watching me. You know what I mean? I, I mean, I actually will wait for her to come back to watch me hang the picture, right? Just a couple of you guys know what I'm talking about. But like, just, I just, it's better. The Holy Spirit, Jesus says when the Holy Spirit comes in your life, it's better. You're not alone. There's the, there's the comforter, the Holy Spirit who is available. So how do we experience Messiah? I want to encourage somebody today at the end of this service to open up your heart and say, Holy Spirit, I invite you in. Jesus, I want to be your follower. I want to commit my heart to you. I want to follow you with everything I've got. And I just would ask that you would be with me. I just pray that your spirit would be in me because you are never alone. His presence by the power of the Holy Spirit is with you at all times. How else can we experience Messiah? How does he allow us to experience? The second way is through his people, his people. A lot of times God will show up. He'll show up in your life through the people that he sends into your life. He'll show up. The Messiah will show up by sending somebody to speak into your life things that will bring you strength and hope and healing and health. Um, I won't go deep into this story, um, but, but many, many years ago, I, I was going through a very hard time in my life. And uh, I, I was, I was my, I, my father has, had, had just uh, been diagnosed uh, with a terminal illness. He was on his way. He was dying. And I was just going through an upheaval. My, my life was, it just felt disoriented and, and, and out, of, out of sync. I didn't, know, I didn't know what to think. I didn't know how to, how to act. I, I woke up feeling anxious. I was feeling anxiety. I was waking up feeling fear uh, and uncertainty in my life. And um, a, a couple friends of mine pulled me aside and said, man, why don't you talk to somebody? Why don't you go see a counselor? Now, in my upbringing, that was not a thing, okay? It, it, like a counselor. I'm like, you mean like a therapist? They're like, yeah, go, go speak to a professional about your, about your feelings. I was like, no, I don't, first of all, I don't have feelings, so I'm not going to talk. No. Um, <laughs> but it was, it, it was just a completely foreign concept to me. But because I realized at a certain point, like things were not working for me, I, I was physically fine, but emotionally I just was off. I finally got on a, a list and, and looked up a list of counselors and there was a woman uh, I called a couple of them and you know I just didn't connect you know I just wasn't my world I, I got on the phone with uh, this woman uh, and I just loved I just loved her immediately I could just tell this is gonna this is gonna be awesome and so we, we got off the phone she said come see me so I went to her office in Pasadena California never been to a counselor before but she was a licensed professional counselor and I went into her office and she was amazing uh, African-American woman in her mid 50s big smile, big hug. Like I was expecting some weird like clinical Freudian thing with the beard and the couch and everything. And she was just like, come on in, come on, tell me what's going on. And I sat down and I started talking and I talked and I cried for a solid hour. And then she was like, okay, great. We'll see you next week. <laughs> and I did it again. And I did that for like, I don't know, three or four or five months in a row. And as I was doing that, what, what happened is this anxiety began to lift off of me. I began to think more clearly. I began to make better choices. I began to involve other people. I, be, I began to reach out to other people who cared about me and loved me and said, hey, can I get your input? Can I get your advice? Can I get your help? It was a transformative experience. And, and whenever anything major happens in my life, I call up Willetta Helene. I call her up and I say, hey, Willetta, when, when Rebecca and I got married, I said, you got to come to the wedding. She came to the wedding. I'm like, and then when we had our first child, called her up, second child, so forth, all the way down. When the church, when we planted the church, I called Willetta. Every major event on Wednesday before Thanksgiving this year, this week, I called Willetta. And I just said, hey, I just want to say again. <laughs> she probably doesn't remember me. It's been 15 years. But I'm like, I just want to say again, thank you for allowing God. She, she was a Christian, which I didn't know at the time, and I was not. God used this woman to use her gifts to help bring health and healing and hope to me. Here's what the scripture says about how God shows up with people. It says, where there is no counsel, when you don't have people speaking into your life in meaningful ways, the people will fall. Will fall. 
When, when, you, when you just think you got to do it on your own, when you hold everybody at arm's length, when you insist on doing it your own way, when you're prideful and, 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 and unwilling to receive counsel from someone else, it will not go well. People will fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Scripture is teaching us if we want to experience the Messiah, we can experience him by bringing other people into our life who can speak wisdom into our life, who can bring counsel into our life, who can bring strength and help and knowledge into our life. I want to take a real quick minute here, and I want to invite uh, one, one of our partner agencies is uh, Crossroads Counseling Agency, and some of their uh, counselors are here this morning. If you work for Crossroads Counseling, would you mind to come forward this morning and just let me uh, introduce you to our church? and. Um, these guys, both of you, both of these folks are actual members of our church. Um, yeah, we can hear it. For... Come on up this way, Debbie. Um, um, Crossroads Counseling, we, we sponsor and partner with a couple counseling agencies, Avenues Counseling Agency and Crossroads Counseling Agencies. These are both Christian counseling agencies in St. Louis where their counselors are followers of Jesus. They love the Lord. They love the church, they love the Bible, and they love to help people get through hard times. You don't have to do this alone, all right? You don't have to get through stuff alone. I wanted to just take a moment this morning and, and introduce them to you and um, allow them to tell you just a little bit about their practice. So Debbie, would you just tell us a little bit about your practice? All right, good morning everyone, and happy, happy post-Thanksgiving. I um, hope everyone had a warm holiday. Uh, so at Crossroads, we're all Margaret's here there in the morning service. There were others, but we are all trained clinically to sit with people in a skillful and an astute manner. But for me, I think most importantly, whether the, um, per the client knows it or not, I'm sitting with them in a prayerful manner and in a very compassionate manner because we're just people all trying to walk through life and there are challenges and transitions and difficulties. And sometimes we just need to process things out loud. So that's how I sit with my clients. Um, I love working with people who, um, I love working with women especially, that's my heart. I, I didn't realize that until I got into it, but I really love working with uh, women, young women, um, 17 years old, teenagers who are trying to transition into adulthood young adults transitioning into marriages or whatever, careers. Um, all the way through the senior years, um, I, I like, uh, I've worked with people who are grieving. I've, I've sat through grief, so I understand that. Um, I love working with couples. I'm a married person of 32 years. I've faced challenges relationally with my husband. Um, we've gone through many different seasons in life, but I just feel like that's a gifting and a call that I have to work with people who are wanting to be married or in marriage and struggling in their marriages. Um, so anyway, those are my, I love working with women, I love working with couples um, and people who are grieving. I kind of want to see Debbie, but I think I'm not allowed to. Um, my name is Margaret Fay. I've been working at Crossroads for about six years. I see a ton of ages from adolescents, college age, young adults and up. And I work with issues, anxiety, depression, self-harm, and I have some special training in trauma. Awesome. Um, also, before, before they sit down, I just wanna say a number of the Crossroads counselors are also at the Shaw campus. So those at the Shaw campus, would you stand and be recognized by the folks there at Shaw? as well, and would you here all help me give the Crossroads Counseling counselors a very warm thank you and a warm welcome. They are, they are truly, truly wonderful counselors. Um, I was out there uh, last week, two weeks ago, doing a Bible study with about 20 of them. And let me just tell you, um, Debbie and Margaret are are representative of the people that you'll meet out there, men and women counselors that are uh, compassionate and they love the Lord and, and it's not, you don't have to be crazy to go talk to a counselor. Amen, somebody? Amen. All the counselors in the house said amen. All right. Um, and, and the third way, I want to just say this and I'm going to wrap this up. 
that God shows up, the Messiah shows up in our life, uh, his presence, his people, but also through his promises, through his promises. Um, what we have to recognize is that when God makes a promise, he's not making a promise from within time. God stands outside of time. He's not subject to linear time because he created time. And so when he makes a promise, it's the same as if it is already done. God does not wait for his promises to be fulfilled. When God makes his promise, he's also making the fulfillment of his promise. So when you listen to and read the promises of God, I want you to see it not just from your perspective, but see it from the perspective of God himself, who's, who when he makes the promise, it's already been accomplished. You can rely upon the promises of God as if they have already happened in your life. You don't have to wait to see if they're going to happen. They're going to happen because he made them happen. Um, I'll close with this very quickly, but I made a promise. Some of you parents know this. Sometimes you get roped into a promise that you didn't mean to get roped into because your kid asks you something while you're thinking about something else. And you just say, yeah, 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 yeah we'll do that. Well, just before Halloween, my, my, my second son, Lincoln, said, Dad, I, I want to roast some, um, he wanted to roast some pumpkin seeds. And I, I mean, that's just like so outside of my, my mind that when he asked me, I was probably doing three other things. And I said, yeah, yep, we'll do that. Well, I, I kind of forgot about it, like about 10 minutes later. Well, about a week later, he says, hey, man, you, Dad, you said we were going to do the pumpkin seeds, roast them. I said, oh, okay, yeah, we, yep, I did, so we'll do that, right? Well, I don't know if you know, but Halloween is like a long time in the past. And um, we're past Thanksgiving even. And this week, he comes to me and he goes, hey, Dad, you said we were going to roast some pumpkin seeds. So, and I thought, well, wait a minute, pumpkin season, I think, is over. So can I even, can you get a pumpkin at the end of November? I don't know. And so I started, I started, I started calling some pumpkin places this week. And they're like, well, pumpkin season's over. And so you can't have pumpkins. But then one guy said, actually, there are pie pumpkins that you can still get. And I got through to a produce person at Deerberg's. And he said, yeah, we actually still have pie pumpkins, which apparently are pumpkins that you make pies out of. He said, you can come. I said, do they have seeds? He said, yes, they do have seeds. He said, as a matter of fact, because I told him the whole story. He said, the pie pumpkins have better seeds for roasting than the regular pumpkins. I said, I'm on my way. So I went and got a pie pumpkin this week. And I came home and I said, son, not only did I fulfill my promise, but I'm bringing you some seeds that are better than the seeds that I would have given to you if you got them at the time that you wanted them. Amen. Amen. God's going to fulfill his promise and it's going to be better. Not because he forgot to pick up the pumpkin seed, but it's going to be better than what you could have ever asked. Last thing Isaiah, from Isaiah that I want to read, he says this, I've, I took you from the ends of the earth. He's talking to you. I took you from the farthest corners. I called you. I said, you're my servant. I have chosen you. He said, I've not rejected you. So then he said this, so do not fear. Why? Because I am with you. That means he was with you when you didn't know he was with you. He was with you when you were not with him. He was with you when you were running. He was with you when you were afraid. He was with you when you were in trouble. He was with you the whole time. I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. These are my promises. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. You're not alone. You are not alone. The teaching of Isaiah, the scriptures about the Messiah, teach us that you are not alone. He's with you even now. And his promises are yea and amen. They just keep going. I promise I'm going to close with this. This is for real. I'm closing right now. There's a, 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 a gospel singer uh, named Sister Rosetta Tharp from way back in the 30s and the 40s. Uh, like, I love that old kind of 30s and 40s type music. Sister Rosetta Tharp, they called her like 
um, the, the, godmother, the godmother of rock and roll because she was a gospel singer, but she played, uh, she played electric guitar distorted. So you should just YouTube that, okay? Uh, Sister Rosetta Tharp, she was ama- her voice is incredible. But she used to sing this song, and I'm not going to sing it. I promise you. I'm just going to give you the lyrics. She used to sing this song, and it was called Never Alone. And the lyrics say, I, I saw the lightning flash, and I've heard the thunder roll, and I've felt sin's breakers crashing, trying to conquer my soul. I've, in other words, I've, I've felt alone. I've, I've, I've seen the storm. I've been in the midst of it. And then she said, but I heard the voice of Jesus telling me to still fight on, telling me that he'll never leave me. He will never leave me alone. And then the chorus goes, go, it says, no, never alone. No, never alone. He will never leave me. Never leave me alone. No, never alone. No, never alone. He will never leave me. Never leave me alone. Today, wherever you are in your life, whatever you're experiencing, whatever frailty, hardship, fear, anxiety, difficulty that you're experiencing, I just want you to leave with this today. You are never alone. You are never alone. He is with you even now. Let me pray for you. Father, we come before you and we just ask that the, the, the power of that truth would really, would really take hold of our life. To actually realize that we're not alone, that you are with us, that you'll never leave us nor forsake us, that you're with us even now, it is a powerful reality. With you in us, we can get through anything. We can get through any hardship and any pain, any struggle, any fear, because you are with us and we are never alone. And God, I just pray that that simple truth would land in somebody's heart today, that they would, they would take the steps that they need to take to experience the reality of your presence in their life. And God, I just pray that as we near the Christmas season and as we go through the ups and downs and, and the highs and lows that accompany this time of year, that we would hold on to this promise and we would hold on to this truth that you will never, never leave us alone. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.